ahead and get started. So, good evening. My name is Corky. I'm with Yolo Basin Foundation and um, just a couple housekeeping things. If you can um, go ahead and make sure you keep yourself on mute, that'll be helpful to the program. Um, and I do want to share a little bit about what we're what we have going on. So first of all, of course, this evening, we're here for our fly nights with Michael Starkey. Um, he's going to be sharing with us about the snakes of California, the Golden State snakes. Um, and he also will be visiting us later uh, next month uh, when we have duck days. And uh, our final program of the year uh, for Flyway Nights, or of the, the six months that we do the program, um, is going to be April 7th, and that's going to be on the Sacramento Perch. And you, you might be going, well, why in the world would they choose the Sacramento Perch when there's so many different choices? Well, it's because Sacramento Perch are having a tough time in the state. And part of that is because there are other sunfish, other perches that are um, have it, you know, giving issues to this particular species. And so when the Department of Fish and Wildlife was trying to find ponds that did not have inlet outlets where there could be issues with other fish, they put their eye on our demonstration area. And so we have Sacramento perch now that are living their life in the demonstration area right here um, behind the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area headquarters. And we wanted to learn a little bit more about them. So we're pretty excited to uh, be hearing more about the Sacramento perch next month. And finally, again, next month in April, very last day of the month, uh, April 30th, we are back with California Duck Days. California Duck Days is our wildlife and wetlands festival. Uh, and we have all kinds of great plans. It's going to be fully outdoors um, this year. We won't be using the shop for those of you who have come in the past. Um, it, the exhibitor hall uh, is now more like an exhibitor area. Um, and we're going to be making use of both the front parking lot uh, and then all spread throughout the demonstration wetlands. So pretty excited uh, about that event coming up. So mark your calendars, bring your family, just like this beautiful wood duck hen is bringing along her ducklings. So I am going to go ahead and turn over the spotlight to Michael Starkey of Save Our Snakes. So we can hear more about these great animals. Thank you for joining us tonight, Michael. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. So let me get my PowerPoint all set up and then we will jump right into this presentation. All right, can everyone give me some thumbs up if you can see my screen? Cool. So um, it's such a, a wonderful experience to be here. Uh, you know, the Yolo Basin Foundation has been doing such incredible work and they protect some habitat and do environmental education for some species that are very near and dear to my heart, uh, many of which I will talk about today. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of a background about who I am, so my name is Michael Starkey. I'm the founder and executive director of Save the Snakes, which is a nonprofit organization based in Sacramento, California. And if you haven't heard about us, that's okay. Um, we work with some very uncharismatic wildlife, the snakes. But we're mostly have been sort of a, a digital organization up until last year where we opened an office. And very recently, we've moved into a new facility in um, just next to Riverbend Park in Rancho Cordova. So we actually have a place where we have our snakes, we do education programs, and we're developing some really exciting programs for uh, the community of Sacramento and beyond in California. But my background is I'm a wildlife biologist and I've, I grew up in Sacramento and I've been very passionate about all wildlife, but snakes especially. And I've worked with um, giant garter snakes, which is uh, a resident or a native species to the Sacramento Valley, um, but also San Francisco garter snakes, California red-legged frogs, 
um, California tiger salamanders, uh, even have done a little bit of bat work as well. Uh, but my work um, started to really change when I started working internationally. And I started working on wildlife conservation projects uh, around the world, specifically in Western, uh, West Africa and Ghana, working with rare frogs. So working with communities to protect forests and watersheds to protect amphibians. And then also working in Northern, Northern Belize with black howler monkeys. And so actually, again, working with a group of wonderful people to reintroduce uh, howler monkeys into the wild and protect their rainforest habitat. And while I haven't always worked with snakes, um, it's kind of been always in the background because when you're you know, in the rainforest, you know, looking for monkeys in the trees, you always see snakes. Um, and the same goes wherever you travel in the world. Um, and as birders and people interested in wildlife are always looking up with their binoculars, the people interested in snakes and, you know, creepy crawlies are looking down. And so I spent a lot of time doing that around the world. And I've noticed that snakes get a really bad rap. And probably as you know, they aren't, again, the most, I guess, charismatic species on the planet. So I'm really excited to share some of my knowledge with you today about some of our snakes in California. But then also I want to bust some myths about snakes and tell all of you what you can do to make your snake or your, your yard or your property a little bit snake safe, not only for snakes and other wildlife, but for maybe your family, your pets, and if you have livestock. So let's jump right in. We're going to learn a lot about snakes today. And if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and Corky and I will be going through and answering all those questions at the end. Okay, first of all, little is known about snakes. They are very cryptic animals. They uh, rely on their camouflage to blend in the surroundings. They're secretive. Scientists are really, you know, scratching the surface about these amazing animals. And so just like this rattlesnake species, this is the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. They really are masters of camouflage. And so by being so cryptic and kind of mysterious, it can create maybe some myths and superstitions about these animals. And researchers can also have a really hard time studying them. So again, the world is opening up to snakes. More people are interested about them. More scientists are going out and studying them. And so we are learning so much about these amazing animals. And we're learning just what, how interesting and fascinating they are. So what, oops, there we go. There's a few points that I'm hoping that you can take home tonight, or you're already home, but you know, take home and share with your friends. And first, snakes are critically important animals for our world, and for a few reasons. One, they maintain balance in the food web. So snakes, you know, just like our gopher snakes and garter snakes, they're predators. So they actually eat other animals. Um, so they actually keep their prey populations in, in, in check. But they're also food for many other species. So, you know, it's not too often I've seen a very happy red-tailed hawk carrying off a gopher snake you know, and, and it's unfortunate for the snake, but as a prey species, they are, you know, a food source for many other uh, wildlife. And they're an excellent form of pest control. So snakes really are a farmer's best friend because they can go places that hawks and owls can't go. So creeping under, you know, barn floorboards, going on the agricultural fields and saving farmers a lot of money off of free pest control service. And so, there's a lot of other reasons that snakes are, you know, valuable or important, but at a minimum, they deserve our respect. And so my job is not to convince you why, you know, we need to love all the snakes and, you know, think they're great. And before you know it, you're going to have snakes all in your house. That's not what we do <laughs> because fear of snakes is a, a real thing. And so I'm hoping that if you do have a little bit of fear of snakes, but I have a feeling some of you are really big fans of snakes. But if you do have a little bit of fear, you know, have an open mind and let's learn together. And maybe by the end of the presentation, snakes won't be so, you know, fearful or mysterious. But they are. And much of our society is really afraid of snakes. And sometimes this fear of snakes can get overblown to the point where in some states in the United States, they actually round up rattlesnakes at these wildlife I'm not going to call them a wildlife festival. It's a rattlesnake roundup. And where they, they round them up, collect them from all over, and actually kill them in mass. 
And so this is an example of these uh, of events that are, you know, we, we couldn't do this with any other animal, um, well, at least in the United States. It would be against the law. But snakes, because of this fear, they really do, um, they don't have the same privileges as some other wildlife. You know, they're not cute and cuddly. And so this fear and misunderstanding is actually a barrier to their conservation. Let's get into that. And so because snakes are not charismatic, you know, they really aren't the most beautiful, um, they face conservation challenges. And I, I like to point out tigers as an excellent example of a, a beautiful charismatic species. Millions of dollars are raised every year for the conservation of tigers around the world. Tigers are incredibly important species and they really, um, you know, they get a lot of conservation funding as a result. And that's not to, you know, discredit tigers, but it's a point of it just by this animal existing, it, it has all that conservation attention paid to it. But snakes, not so much. So if we look at this snake right here, this is a giant garter snake. And so to me, this is a very beautiful snake. But to others, this may just look like a greenish brown snake, but you can find them in, um, in the Yolo Basin, the Sacramento Valley. They love our rice fields and marshes, but it's a big brown water snake, essentially. And that doesn't necessarily charm people so that they want to, you know, donate millions to save the giant garter snake. And so scientists and conservationists have to be a little bit creative to save the less charismatic species. And so there are many threats to snakes around the world. And just like tigers and elephants and pangolins and other species around the world, some of the same threats impact snakes as well. So first, habitat destruction. Just like any other wildlife species, snakes are losing their homes. They're you know, being constructed into homes and businesses or, or agriculture. Agriculture and where people are kind of spreading out from cities and that's creating a conflict with wildlife and especially snakes. Another big issue is actually disease with snakes. So this is an issue now for, you know, just like our bats in California, um, which in around the United States, and around the world with um, white nose syndrome, snakes also have a fungus to worry about through snake fungal disease, which has actually been found in California. But back east, it's really impacted some of our uh, you know, our, our rattlesnake species, as well as some uh, non-venomous snakes as well. So infectious disease is a problem for snakes. Pollution and pesticides, what goes out into the environment has an impact on snakes. Climate change, believe it or not, climate change is actually a problem for snakes, but sometimes also a good thing for snakes. A new paper just came out that uh, rattlesnakes in parts of California are actually going to thrive in climate change. And as the area where they live heats up, it's going to allow them to extend their range. And so where some people may not actually have rattlesnakes, there may be rattlesnakes uh, in a few years to come with increasing temperatures, warming temperatures. So, but in other parts of the world where rainforests are drying up and we're seeing uh, des desertification, it can have in impacts to snake habitat. And then also big issues over harvesting, whether it's for the pet trade or for food or other reasons, the over harvesting of snakes can be a big problem. And then invasive species. So uh, there are actually some famous examples of invasive snakes, maybe you've heard about Burmese pythons in the Everglades, but also other invasive species actually impact snakes. And so whether they're rats or if anyone has an outdoor cat, I'm sorry, but they actually do impact our native wildlife quite a bit. And cats and other non-native predators can really wipe out snakes really quickly if they're not used to having those animals around. And then myths and superstitions, big problems for snakes, just because there are some myths that uh, they, they convince people that there's something wrong with the snake or it can harm them in some way. Um, and that, um, you know, not uh, accurate information could have negative consequences for the snakes, which results in persecution. So by far, uh, snakes are definitely one of the most persecuted animals on the planet. If you look at, uh, you know, our common saying, any good snake is a dead snake, um, there, there really is a lot of hatred and fear, which results in snakes being killed. And so we have to com combat that because, you know, snakes have a very important role in the ecosystem. And so 
if we go out of our way to kill snakes, then that can actually really hamper conservation efforts for snakes. And so this presentation is gonna kind of loop around. We're gonna learn uh, quite a bit about our snakes of the Sacramento Valley. I want you to identify the snakes that you might have in your backyard, or maybe you've seen them in some of our wildlife areas. And then we're gonna kind of go around and learn about uh, what to do, how to keep snakes from our yard or make wildlife friendly habitat. But then we'll also learn about what to do with snake bite. And then we're gonna tie, tie it back into some conservation messaging for snakes. So I wanna introduce you to some really cool snakes in our golden state. And if you are an outdoors person, you definitely know the Pacific gopher snake. It's large, charismatic, um, might put on a good show if it's a little upset. But these are very large, heavy-bodied snakes. They can get up to seven feet long, although we usually see them about three or four feet long. They're very common throughout California. And probably one of the most common snakes that we might see around the Sacramento area, but in Davis, Winters, Woodland, very, very common, grasslands. They can pretty much do okay in like disturbed habitats as well. So whether that's oak woodlands and then, you know, coming into like agricultural areas, they're a very hardy snakes. And they thrive on rodents and birds. That is their, their main source of food. So, and they can sometimes be misidentified as a rattlesnake. And we're gonna dive into that in a little bit. Another snake that you may know is the beautiful California king snake. These snakes, black and white, sometimes brown and yellow are a combination of the two. Um, they are, you know, very, very, uh, it's kind of, they're a dramatic looking snake in my opinion. And it's always interesting when you find one out in the wild because you're like, how do you blend in? Like, this doesn't make sense. Um, but that striped coloration actually is a good source of camouflage and they disappear into grass um, and it's pretty amazing. So, and they're also a medium sized snake about four feet long. They're throughout the Western states even though they have California king snake in their name. They're varied uh, in their habitats. Um, they're usually found around nighttime, so the nocturnal species, but they can be, you know, active during the day. They're a pretty overall generalist snake. They'll eat lizards, they'll eat other snakes, including our rattlesnakes, rodents. They're a very hardy, robust snake. So if you've ever spent some time in the grasslands of the Sacramento Valley, you may have quickly seen this snake. Uh, it's called a yellow-bellied racer, and racer is very apt for its name because it is very quick to get out of the way. So these are a diurnal snake active during the day. They get about four feet long and they love to eat lizards and rodents and anything they can really catch uh, during the hottest part of the day. And so we see them a lot in grasslands and some open type habitat. And what's interesting about this snake is that sometimes um, if you find a, a young one, so one that's been you know, hatched from an egg, it's a neonate, and it goes through this dramatic shift in its coloration. And it starts um, with a blotched brown and yellow coloration, almost looking like a baby gopher snake, and then changing to the solid gray green color. It's a pretty amazing color shift, but it has to do quite a bit with where these snakes are uh, hanging out in their environment when they're young and then when they go out and they mature and go out into open grasslands. Very fast snake and they're quite special to see them if you if you've happened to come across them in the field. Okay, so garter snakes. So this is kind of a tough one to just talk about one. And so I decided just to kind of lump them all together um, because there's a, quite a few species in California. There's actually 14 subspecies and I'm sure some scientists would debate me on if that's the accurate number. Um, but around the Sacramento Valley, like right around Sacramento, we have about three species. And you can really tell these snakes by their bright stripes. And so most species have what we call a uh, mid-dorsal stripe, meaning that it has a stripe that goes right down its back. And so it's a really easy way to identify these snakes. It's black with a bright orange or yellow stripe. And they're mostly associated with water, but sometimes you can find them a little bit further from water. But these are aquatic snakes, so generally you will find them near water and eating fish, frogs, but some species will eat worms and vertebrates. Um, uh, some will even eat, eat rodents as well. 
Now, so I did want to mention though, most of the time, these are pretty small, slender, fast moving snakes with the exception of our giant garter snake. And so we saw one photo of a giant garter snake. They do get quite large. And the giant garter snake is the largest garter snake in the world. It only lives in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley. So the central Valley of California. And the records are about five feet. Um, and that's a big snake uh, for a garter snake, which is normally, you know, people, you know, they're tiny. So that species is really interesting. Uh, it's one that I've worked with a lot uh, in the Sacramento Valley, and they are very, very special that we have them uh, around in our, our backyards. So I did want to include a couple snakes that you might find if you're coming from the foothills, because especially some of us may not live like in Sacramento or Davis, um, you know, we might live, you know, maybe in Folsom or, you know, maybe in winters. And so we start getting a little bit into the, the woodland areas of the foothills. And one that you might see is a striped racer, also called a chaparral whip snake. And I want to talk about this because if you saw it, you might think it's a garter snake. It's fast, it's black and yellow. Um, however, these snakes have two stripes on their sides. We call them lateral stripes. So they go along the, the, the sides of their body. And they are up in chaparral so they love dry open grasslands they're much like our, our racers down in the valley and so if you're out around Folsom or the foothills you might find these snakes uh running around looking for lizards to eat they're active foragers and they can get quite big too about five feet and these snakes have also been known to eat rattlesnakes too so another good snake to have around if you aren't a fan of rattlesnakes and if you're really lucky, you might find this snake called a night snake. Uh, this is sort of a, I have not seen one in the Sacramento area, but I'd really like to. And I found that there's a few records of them up in Folsom. And these are kind of a, a, a really interesting snake. And like their name, they are nocturnal. They live, you know, in kind of rocky, arid, dry places. They're really common in the desert. So you can find them in Mojave you know, down to Southern California, but they are almost very, very similar to a rattlesnake in coloration. But again, they're small, only up to about three feet, but they have this, you know, dark color blotches that sometimes can misidentify them. They are a venomous snake, um, but they are not dangerous to humans. So in the world of venomous snakes, we call a snake that is really venomous, uh, medically significant. <laughs> which is kind of a funny term because you would think of snake bite. Yeah, that's, that's pretty medically significant. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of the, the word, the terminology we use when a snake is like a rattlesnake has very potent venom. But there are many species around the world that have um, venom that either is not as potent or their fang structure, how they deliver venom is somewhat rudimentary or just, it doesn't, it can't, pack as much of a punch, literally it cannot um, inject as much venom as maybe a rattlesnake could with those front fangs, right? And night snakes have fangs in the back of their mouth and they have a very a modified saliva gland where actually venom starts, uh, kind of pools down these back fangs. Getting a little bit in the weeds with the venom, but it's a very fascinating subject. And these snakes are, you know, again, nocturnal, and also just note, they have a, 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 a vertical pupil, and which is kind of interesting because if you've ever heard, oh, how to identify, you know, rattlesnakes, um, sometimes they say venomous snakes have like cat pupils, like slits. It's not always accurate. So very, very cool little snake. And if you see one, it's kind of a special thing. Okay. And so I have to talk about these cute little snakes. Um, and some of you may have them in your backyards, or you may not know about it. So these are sharp tail snakes, and sometimes they're called red racers, um, but they're not that quick. Um, they're, you might even think that they're a giant worm or a slug. They love to uh, thrive in garden beds. They love to be under planters pots in moist soil. They spend most of the year underground when it's either too cold or if it's too hot. But then during those kind of that perfect temperature in the spring and around the fall, they, they come up and they are actively looking for food, mostly at night, and they love to eat slugs, slugs and, um, you know, other small invertebrates. And so these are great snakes for the garden. They can really uh, help with your, your slug population, but they are red, pinkish, sometimes brownish too. Um, really interesting snake. 
And so if you do find them, they're also pretty special to have in your backyard. Okay, so we have to talk about the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. This is our definitely our, our, our medically significant venomous snake of the area. And it's the only one. There's 10 subspecies of rattlesnakes in California, but the Northern Pacific rattlesnake is the only snake that we have around the greater Sacramento and actually up into Northern California. And it's a pretty good sized snake. They get about four feet long. Um, and you know, you can't really misidentify them. Uh, they have those nice diamonds down their, their back, um, but they really can be different colors. And so I have a couple pictures here where that show their typical kind of coloration of this brown with these diamonds, but they can also be gold, like really gold, sometimes even dark in coloration. And sometimes I've even seen some that are green. And if you've ever heard about rattlesnakes and maybe the Mojave green rattlesnake, um, which are not always green, but sometimes they're known to be, our Northern Pacifics can get a kind of greenish coloration too. And these are a really beautiful snake, but again, because they are venomous and they like to be around where people are, because uh, people like to live in their backyards, um, they like rocky conditions, you know, around the foothills and along the American River. And so we can find them in areas by the river where there's lots of rocks, oak woodland, uh, and they are a very common snake. Uh, and actually some places they are the most common snake. Um, they're a, a survivor of a, um, a species and they actually do really well, uh, even in areas where there's lots of people. And so as a venomous snake, there are things you need to can be considerate about because they're you know, potentially a very dangerous animal. And so we're gonna dive into that though, because we wanna appreciate the beauty of these snakes and just give everyone a little bit of information about them. But we'll talk about snake bites soon. So let's go through some myths. And if like most wildlife, there's a lot of tall tales, but with snakes, it seems like there's many tales, um, puns, and, puns included. So the biggest one with rattlesnakes, <coughs> excuse me, is that snakes are aggressive and they will chase you. Um, I hear this quite often, um, you know, whether it was a, a, a venomous snake back east called a cottonmouth chasing you or, you know, an aggressive Western diamondback rattlesnake. Um, but the reality is, is that snakes are defensive animals. And I, I really like that word versus aggressive because aggressive you know, that's something is coming at you. Something has an intention to hurt you. Snakes, there is, we can't give anything to snakes. <laughs> like they, um, we have nothing that they want. And so when a rattlesnake looks like on the screen, this Western diamondback rattlesnake, it's, it's full of air, it's rattling, it's trying to look as big as possible. It's actually an animal that's as terrified for its life. And it's trying to put on its best show to, to warn you so that you will stay away. You know, they're really good bluffers, um, but there's no reason for them to actually chase you. And sometimes when you see a rattlesnake, it can be a stressful event. It makes um, your mind wander. And if a snake is moving any direction, and if it happens to move towards you, people might interpret that as being chased. Um, but believe me, the snakes have nothing to do, wanting to do with you at all. And so, yeah, if you give snakes space, they will happily move away on their own. They don't really want to encounter us. And so sometimes a snake won't actually move, even if you approach it. And part of the reason is um, if they have not reacted and they're, they're buzzing, so shaking their tail, they might actually be rely on their camouflage, even if they're out in the open. Sometimes they just they lay stretched on a trail and they're like, you can't see me. I'm a stick. I'm blending in. Um, but they really are just trying to hope you don't notice them. But it's really when you get too close that they put on that good show. And so when you give snakes the opportunity to retreat somewhere, that's when they're just going to be happily fine to go leave the area. Next one. So baby snakes can't control their venom and are even more dangerous than adults. Yeah, this one is not true. And so there is some interesting information about this though. But first, the venom glands on a baby rattlesnake are tiny compared to an adult rattlesnake. And so we have a, a rattlesnake um, in our facility. It's a Western diamondback rattlesnake. And its head is 
I mean, it's going to look huge here, but because it looks as big as my head, but no, it's, it's like the size of the palm of my hand. It's a giant snake. It's about five feet long. So maybe not that giant, but the venom glands in that snake are huge compared to a baby rattlesnake, which might have the head, the size of a quarter. And so the idea though, is that if you're bitten and you're injected with venom, the more venom, the more dangerous, right? Um, and so when you have so much more venom in your body, it's a much more serious bite, which requires more medical treatment. And so the potential for an adult is very, it's much higher to be a, a worse bite, but that doesn't matter because all snake bites, all venomous snake bites from a rattlesnake are, a, it's a, it's an emergency. And whether it's a little baby or it's an adult, you must seek medical attention immediately. So want to bust that myth because that's one also here quite a bit. Um, and so remember, yeah, those baby rattlesnakes, if you're bitten by one, go see the doctor or we'll go to the emergency room as soon as possible. So I wanted to just go through a couple other myths. Um, here's an example again of a, a baby Western diamondback, very, very tiny little snake. But this is a good one too. So you can tell a rattlesnake's age by the number of segments in its rattle. So when we look at a rattlesnake's rattle, and of course I don't have my rattle right here because I'm not prepared, my apologies. But so they are interlocking segments of keratin. If I can find it really quick. No, I'm not gonna be able to. So, sorry, I was gonna pull it out of the book. But okay, so they're interlocking segments of keratin. And so there's no you know, little beads in there or things rattling around. There are pieces of keratin stacked on top of each other. And by the interlocking nature of that keratin, moving is what makes a sound. And every single time a snake sheds, because when a snake sheds its skin, it peels off, you know, kind of like a sock pulling off your foot, um, it kind of makes a new segment. And so that's why when you look at a rattlesnake, it's not the age, each segment of the tail, it's, um, or the rattle, excuse me, it's just each time it's shed. And in the wild, because it's keratin, which is what our fingernails are made out of, they break all the time. And so it's, it's really common that when you find a rattlesnake's tail, it's, that's not going to be, you can't tell how old it is because they break quite often. And so uh, this is another big one. Um, rattlesnakes will always rattle before they bite or before they strike. Um, if anyone has encountered a rattlesnake in Northern California, you may notice that there were times that the snakes did not rattle. Um, this is very, very common that snakes will not rattle at all. Um, and there have been times where a completely resting snake has actually struck at me. Um, so it's really important to, if you do encounter a rattlesnake, you know, do not approach and wait for it to rattle before it will strike because they will, um, they will strike if they feel threatened. And so also to some species of rattlesnakes are a little bit more keen to rattle than others, just because of the nature, of, um, again, of their predators and how they interact in their environment. Like our Northern Pacific rattlesnakes are not, they don't seem to want to rattle right away. Um, however, temperature can greatly determine if a snake rattles and it doesn't. So if you encounter a snake first thing in the morning, the rattlesnake is cool. You know, because remember, reptiles and snakes are ectotherms. They rely on the, the, the sun to be able to regulate their, their body temperature, their metabolism. And so a cold snake is literally a, you know, basically a, a chill snake. Um, but however, if you encounter a snake later in the day, especially on a hot summer day, um, you would think these snakes were on high octane gasoline because they are just pumped up, you know, striking and they're a completely different animal than if you saw them first thing in the morning. And that is just because of that, that, uh, that temperature difference. And so again, encountering a snake during a different time of the day, it may act differently as well. And then lastly, this is an important one. Um, mothballs, snake away, human hair, animal hair will repel snakes. Um, so mothballs is a common one I hear, doesn't work with snakes, it won't keep them away. Uh, snake away is actually, it's a product you can buy at, you know, Home Depot. It's at, uh, I've seen it at Green Acres. Worthless. Um, don't spend your money. Um, I don't think snake away will be sponsoring our organization, but their product doesn't work. Um, but also human or animal hair. I've heard this around, so I feel the need to mention it, but that also will not repel snakes. Um, we will talk about the best thing to do to keep snakes away. 
So diving right into it, we want to enjoy nature, but maybe not in our backyard. We don't want snakes right in our backyard, right? Maybe the sharp tail snakes, but maybe we don't want a rattlesnake. So here's some things to do to make your yard snake safe. Um, really important too is to think about where you live, right? Do you do you know about the native snakes of your area? Because you may not have rattlesnakes, um, so you may not be need to be so concerned about rattlesnakes. But if you do live in an area where there are rattlesnakes, here are some things that you can do. So first, snakes love to hide. They really rely on vegetation and to feel secure in that vegetation. So if you keep grass around pathways and around the home, nice and low, um, you, you, know, you trim your, your bushes, um, it's gonna help make an environment so that snakes don't feel comfortable there. Because again, snakes don't wanna just be out in the open. They really wanna be you know, safe and feel secure. So if you keep the vegetation really well maintained, it's unlikely that snakes will kind of just hang out there. Also, if you have pets um, that you feed outside or provide water outside, or if you have, um, you know, um, wildlife that you feed, like birds, for example, or a bird feeder, um, that food and water will attract other animals, so birds and rodents and things, and that can attract snakes. And then snakes are really also attracted to water because remember we're we're in a drought. We're we seem to be in a drought in perpetuity, but um, those droughts also impact snakes and other wildlife too. And they might become a little bit desperate and they might go places where they normally wouldn't in that search for water. So very, very important. If we have food or water available, um, it might attract snake prey or just be a water source for the snakes. And so we really don't wanna create shelter for snakes. And so if you have a yard that has a lot of um, lawn ornaments or maybe you know a wood project or debris, places snakes that can hide. Um, I think I have a toddler in my house um, well, it's my son. So yeah, and there's toys everywhere. Um, everywhere there's toys. And so I'm very uh, constantly thinking like, ah, oh, okay, there's all these toys that could be shelter for a rattlesnake. Luckily, there's no rattlesnakes in my backyard. But I think about it quite often because those toys left out can provide a safe haven, a little place for a snake to relax. And then if you pick it up, it can potentially be a bite. So by keeping the property relatively neat, not providing shelter for snakes, you're not going to have a problem with snakes. And then really important, we don't want to use glue traps or bird netting. So glue traps maybe to, you know, keep away rodents or, you know, cockroaches or bugs. Those also trap snakes. Um, and unfortunately, those animals really die in a pretty inhumane way. So it helps to use a different form of uh, pest control, keep those animals at bay. But then bird netting, so if you are protecting your vegetables, um, maybe consider a metal like uh, wire or not the plastic monofilament. That monofilament netting, the plastic netting, traps snakes and they also will have a very untimely death. So really important that we don't use things that trap our snakes. And then if you're able to, welcome non-venomous snakes. And so if you can attract gopher snakes and king snakes, that might displace a rattlesnake that might want to hang out there, especially a king snake. Um, king snakes are predators or rattlesnakes, and so they're going to help keep those other snakes away. So when we're thinking about how we keep snakes away, we just think about how a snake uses its environment. It just needs shelter, food, and water. And so if we look at, okay, do I have shelter or there's debris? Is there a water source? And that could be a dripping faucet next to your sprinkler heads um, or, you know, either or. And then is there a food? Um, whether those rodents or birds around, those are gonna attract snakes. We take those out, we won't have a problem with snakes. Now, if you live in rattlesnake country, the best thing to do to fully keep snakes away um, is to invest in a snake fence. Um, that is one of the best ways to keep snakes out of your property. Um, however, they can be quite expensive and you wanna make sure that someone's installing it kind of knows what they're doing because if you install incorrectly, there might be gaps or it, snakes might be able to crawl underneath. And if it's not tall enough, snakes can actually hop over, not hop over, but crawl over. So we wanna make sure that if we do have snake fencing that it's done right. Okay, so let's dive into snake bite. So this is a, a little bit of a tough subject. So, but 
we're not going to really go into some of the gross pictures of snake bite. Um, don't want to do that, but I do want to bust a couple myths about snake bite as well. And first, who gets bitten by snakes? Um, this is a, a a little bit of a stereotype, um, but when I was um, really researching snake bite and you know diving into the subject, and it's and I was thinking, you know, in the United States, who gets bitten? Um, I thought about this guy. Um, so this is the stereotypical snake bite victim, in my opinion. Uh, so it's a guy that's like messed with a snake. And in this instance, this, this guy killed a Eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Um, he's wearing shorts, intentionally messing with the snakes, and he's been drinking. So that's usually the, the combination. It's um, a man, so a guy you know, of any age, um, you know, is intoxicated and is messing with snakes. So this is sort of a kind of a joke among the snake community of like, that's the person that gets bitten, you know, these, these fools, right? Um, but if you actually dive into snake bites and you look at hospital records, this is actually not the case. So there's a, some really interesting papers that have been published on this subject, looking at hospital, um, yeah, um, incidences. So someone is bitten, they go to hospital, the hospital records, you know, the basic information about them. You know, obviously their gender, how, what were the conditions when they were bitten? Unfortunately, it's still men. So men are more likely to get bitten by rattlesnakes than women in the United States. Um, and so this paper was looking at, um, I believe, about 92,000 uh, snake bite instances in the United States. And about 70% were men. Um, however, only about 20%, so 19%, were intentional uh, interaction. So bites occurred when someone was either going to kill a snake or pick up a snake, which is surprising because I, th I actually thought that it was the other way around. I thought that most bites occurred when someone was like harassing a snake. But it's actually not true. 80% of people are bitten by accident. And so, and this happens in a lot of ways. So whether you're hiking and you sit down on a log, you put your foot down and a rattlesnake bites you, that happens. Um, it could be you're working in your garden and you're, you know, putting your hands in, you know, your strawberries. And then there's a baby rattlesnake. That happens. Um, or even um, at FEO Nature Center a few years ago, there was a little girl playing in the playground. And if you know FEO Nature Center, a beautiful situated in Oak Woodland, um, but the playground is pretty, you know, there's no woodland necessarily in the playground. Um, she went and put her hand underneath a little piece of wood and she got bitten by a rattlesnake. So luckily, uh, treating snake bite is uh, quite easy to do in the United States. Um, and about five to six people every year will die, um, which is unfortunate for them. But most of these instances are people who have um, you know, weak immune systems or they delayed treatment. So they actually waited and they waited and they waited before they went to the hospital. And in, in the United States, there's about seven to 8,000 bites per year. Um, so there are quite a bit, very few deaths. So back to this other thing though, what about alcohol? Are people drinking and getting snake bites? Well, scientists study that too. And actually in this particular paper of the 92,000 snake bite victims, less than 1% of people had either had drugs in their system or alcohol. And so that shows you that the stereotype of, you know, this man you know, harassing snakes, you know, drinking uh, isn't necessarily true. Um, although those people still do get bit by snakes. Um, however, though, so when we think about this, the reason I'm painting this picture about who gets bitten by a snake is because I want people to really understand most snake bites are accidents and they happen when you kind of least expect it. You know, you're gardening, you're, you're out on a trail, you're enjoying yourself. But if you live or are enjoying time outside and you happen to be in rattlesnake country, it's really important to think about snake bite and what to do if you're bitten because accidents do happen, but there's a lot of ways that we can protect ourselves from snake bite. And so I do want to talk a little bit about globally what's happening around the world with snake bite, though, because while in the United States, like I said, about, you know, seven to 8,000 people will suffer a serious snake bite envenomation each year, five to six people will die. Around the world, it's a little bit of a different story, and it's actually much more grave. And so each year, about around the world, 2.7 million people will suffer a serious snake bite envenomation. So from cobras, you know, other rattlesnake species, vipers, there's um, many venomous snake species around the world. 
and there are a lot of snake bites. About 125,000 people die and 400,000 are permanently disabled. And so these numbers are actually even uh, low estimates. These are also taken from like clinic records, hospital records, um, but there are people who do not actually go to a clinic or hospital. They might seek traditional healers or, um, or may not make it to a hospital to be recorded. And so many, many people do suffer um, from snake bite and die. And it's um, the most of the people who are really impacted by snake bite are people in this, um, this group called the global majority. So it's um, people who live around the world in uh, under, um, less than $10 a day. So, you know, in the neotropics and, in, in, um, you know, Central South America, Africa, parts of um, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, so many, many people um, who live in rural conditions and often have, um, are living in poverty are the most impacted by snake bite. And so that's why actually the World Health Organization uh, declared snake bite a neglected tropical disease in 2017, which is ironically the same year that our organization was founded. And so with snake bites um, being such a big problem around the world, um, it would make sense that we, we talk about it as an organization trying to save snakes. Um, because again, we learned that snakes have this real bad rap and part of the reason is there's some truth behind it. Snakes are potentially very dangerous animals. And so that's why if we live in areas with snakes, we have to learn how to deal with snake bite. And so some great information that I can leave with you tonight is that if you're bitten by a rattlesnake, follow these steps. And so what I'm going to show you on the screen is what to do. And if I don't mention something, that means don't do it. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about some of that too. So first, if you are bitten by a snake out in the wild or, you know, um, on your property, um, it's kind of important to identify the snake that bit you. However, in Northern California, the only snake that we have to worry about, again, is that Northern Pacific rattlesnake. And so that makes it really easy. So other parts of the world where they have cobras and, and black mambas and soft-scale vipers and, you know, um, different species, uh, it might make it a little bit more complicated, you know, what snake bit you. But here, we just have that rattlesnake. And luckily, all rattlesnake um, bites in the United States are treated with the same anti-venom or also called anti-venin. So you've identified the snake. It's really important to stay calm. And, or if you're with someone who's been bitten, you want to calm them because increased heart rate can actually expedite the absorption of venom. And so maybe you didn't know this, but uh, venom does not actually travel through our blood. It travels through the lymphatic system. So the more we move our body around, that actually spreads venom more quickly. So the idea is we want to be calm, cool as a cucumber, which can be difficult because you've been bitten by a venomous snake, but important to stay calm as much as possible and get to emergency help. That's going to help keep that venom, you know, not moving too much throughout the body. Very important. So if you have jewelry, you've been bitten on the hand, you know, remove your, your rings, um, remove bracelets. If you've been bitten on the ankle, take your boot, boot or shoe off. Um, even if you have like tight jeans or pants, you actually might want to shear them with scissors or a knife because your body is going to swell. And so wherever you've been bitten, um, a rattlesnake bite is going to make the bite swell. And swelling is good. We want swelling. Um, that's actually a natural part of um, your body dealing with this, the venoms. And so we want that swelling to happen. And so we want to immobilize the bitten extremity. So if we've been bitten on the hand, we want to put it in a neutral or slightly elevated position. So I apologize, I should have added slightly elevated in this PowerPoint. But the reason for that, um, by being neutral, when I say neutral, it means to the heart. So if you've been bitten on the hand, you'd want to, you know, get a sling or a way that you can, you know, suspend your hand um, right by your heart uh, or slightly elevated. And the same if you're bitten on your foot or on your ankle, you know, have your foot, you know, neutral or slightly elevated. Um, again, this just helps, you know, again, slow down the venom so your body is not moving um, the venom around um, through the lymphatic system. And so we don't want to, you know, do anything like tying a tourniquet to stop the venom. Uh, we don't want to do that. That's actually going to cause more damage to the body. Um, and if anyone is thinking about a tourniquet, maybe you've heard about, I tie a tourniquet, I tie a tourniquet. Don't do it. That's a big myth about snake bite. 
Um, by tying a tourniquet and stopping blood flow, it actually stops the movement of everything. Uh, so if you're bitten, right, you tie a tourniquet on your hand um, or your, your arm, it's going to stop everything from moving. And so we don't want that because what that does is it actually localizes venom. And so rattlesnake venom is just like corrosive acid, if with for lack of a better word. It is meant to just neutralize and... Um, or what's the um, the other word? Not marinate. Um, oh, I forgot the word. Oh no, someone's getting, thinking of it right now. Um, I'm not going to get it. Okay, so it's uh, it it tenderizes. That's it. Maybe that was it. Yeah. So the rattlesnake venom is basically, you know, think about if it bites a rat. Um, the rat is basically going to die very quickly, and that venom. It's theorized that it might actually start the digestive process. So that venom. Um, you know, while that won't immediately kill us if we're bitten by a snake, um, to a little rat, it would. But for us, if we keep that venom just situated in one place, it starts to necrotize our skin. So it just starts to melt it away. So we don't want that. Um, just like maybe if you've learned about keeping waterways nice, safe, and happy, the solution to pollution is dilution. We want to allow movement, some movement of liquid in our body and, you know, uh, fluids in our body and the same with venom. So we want our bodies well. We don't want to restrict the movement of our blood and lymphatic system through uh, a tourniquet. And we just want to get to a hospital as soon as possible. If you have a Sharpie or some pen, it's important to mark the bite um, and then put the time of the bite as well. And to mark the extent of the swelling literally just means like every, you know, 15 minutes or so, you would just kind of draw an outline where the swelling is. Um, and that's what the doctors are going to do when you arrive to the hospital or if you're with someone who's been bitten. Um, and time of bite is really important. And why are you marking it on yourself? Because simply, again, a snake bite is a very scary situation. And if, you know, you put it on a piece of paper or your phone, you may misplace that information and doctors need to know what time you're bitten and that extent of swelling as much as possible. And then lastly, you want to contact 911 and your local poison control. And if you don't have um, poison control's number in your phone, 1-800-222-1222. Really important. Uh, both numbers are incredibly important because 911 is going to get first aid to you as soon as possible. So that's gonna bring an ambulance. You don't wanna to drive to the hospital if you've been bitten by a venomous snake, because um, uh, not only will you be in pain, but you might pass out, you might get nauseous, you might get hypotension. There's a lot of things that can happen if you're bitten by a snake. Um, so getting ambulance to you, 911 is gonna take care of it. Don't worry about anti-venom, that's not your job. That's poison control's job. And so poison control is gonna say, okay, this snake bite venom is going to, you know, Sutter Health downtown. We need to get the anti-venom to that hospital if they don't already have it. That's their job. And so by calling both numbers, it starts that process a little bit early because when you get to the hospital, normally the hospital will just, they'll get on the phone with poison control and figure out where that anti-venom is. These are the steps you want to take. There's a lot of do nots out there. Um, you know, you don't want to put ice, you don't want to eat or drink. Um, you don't want to, again, apply that tourniquet. And what I hear often is cutting or sucking out the venom. Don't do it. They don't work. These steps right here, you know, identifying the snake, staying calm, removing your jewelry, tight-fitting clothing, immobilizing the bite at a neutral, slightly elevated position, marking the bite, the extent of swelling, the time of the bite, and then getting to emergency services as soon as possible. That is the best way to um, not only, you know, get the medical care that you need to survive, but to also, um, there's a saying in the snake bite world about time is tissue. The quicker you get an anti-venom in your body, the less damage the, um, the venom will do to your body. So, and again, luckily snake bites are very, very rare, uh, um, deaths from snake bite are very rare in the United States. Most people survive, no problems. Okay. So I kind of dived quite a bit into snake bite there um, because I want everyone to have the best information as much as possible when we get to meet some of our snakes of the Sacramento Valley. And there are 
a lot of snakes I didn't talk about in California. And so I invite you all to, to visit californiaherps.com is a wonderful website. iNaturalist, again, another great resource for learning about um, what snakes live in our area. But those are some of the most common ones. You know, we've learned about how to keep snakes away or actually attract them to our house and what to do in a snake bite situation. But now what I wanna do is I wanna just spend a little bit of time introducing you to our organization and tell you what we've been up to in uh, California, but also around the world. And so kind of, as I talked about, saving snakes is really tough. You know, snakes bite people, people die from snake bite. Um, they're, you know, cold blooded creatures um, and most people don't like them. And so that can be really tough for saving species, you know, whether they're our native San Francisco garter snakes, um, in, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area, or king cobras, which are a globally threatened species. These endangered snakes um, need conservation action, but if our society doesn't appreciate them, does not tolerate them being there because they are snakes, that can impede conservation action. And so what our organization does is that we work to protect snake populations around the world through education and community outreach to create a harmonious relationship between humans and snakes. We definitely recognize that people may not love snakes and that is completely fine, but we can be, we can respect snakes and accept that they uh, live in our environment and actually that they do quite a bit for our environment and are good to have around for, you know, farms and agriculture. So snakes are important. The way that we work though, is that we support snake conservationists around the world. So these are individuals who are working on, on a, a project. And it usually it's a community-based conservation project. So that means that these are wildlife conservationists working in their communities and rallying their communities to either stop human snake conflict, so reduce snake bite, or to protect rare snakes. And then what we do is we elevate their work on a digital platform. So we put them on our website, uh, broadcast their efforts through social media, which allows them to actually get more attention to their project and gain more funding which is something conservation projects need desperately around the world. And I wanna introduce you to just some of the projects that we support on a regular basis. Um, but the way that we start to do this is through a grant program. And so again, competition for funding, if you have a conservation project can be really difficult. And it's difficult enough in the United States to raise funds for snake conservation organizations. But imagine if you're a researcher in rural Nepal trying to save king cobras, um, it can be even more difficult for people who are working with these uncharismatic species and competing for funds from other more charismatic wildlife, you know, like bears and elephants and things like that. So we started a grant program, it's called the Save the Snake Support Grant Program, which meant to seed projects because when we started our organization, we were funding one project uh, that was focused on the conservation of king cobras. But when, when we went online, you know, uh, developed our website, our social media presence, we very quickly got calls from around the world to support their project. And so in the period of about four years since we started this uh, program, we've had over 100 proposals from 30 countries on snake conservation or human snake conflict mitigation projects. So people working with, you know, king cobras uh, to, you know, raising awareness in schools for snakes, saving endangered Bushmasters, uh, Bushmasters vipers, which is a South American snake species, uh, or getting people to actually learn to coexist with snakes by training people. And so this kind of proved to us kind of a proof of concept that people need this support to do this really important work to, you know, rally their communities to, you know, coexist with snakes. And then when those communities are a little bit okay with snakes being around, then we can start focusing on those really um, targeted conservation actions for snakes, like protecting snake habitat, restoring snake habitat, and even just learning more about threatened snake species, so studying them in the wild. But first we have to have communities as a part of that process, and they have to be able to uh, be okay with uh, wildlife conservationists studying those animals and saving them. And so since 2017, we've been able to fund 23 projects in 16 countries. Um, and every year we support about, you know, between three and four um, new projects. And again, this is seed funding. So this is small amounts of money uh, meant to really drive um, 
these projects to the next level because sometimes the projects are in their infancy or they haven't even uh, been created. And so we help get these projects off the ground so that they can grow and become a successful wildlife conservation project. And I wanna highlight a few of these really important projects. Um, this is uh, Jeanne Oliveira from Brazil. And she is a, a true wildlife warrior. Uh, she's a researcher uh, who is studying a venomous pit viper. Um, if anyone has uh, learned about South America or Central America snakes, you may have heard about the fur de lance. Um, it's this kind of notorious snake species. This snake is a, um, a type of um, lance head pit viper. Uh, it's called Bothrop sazamai, and it is endemic to one island in Brazil. And so by being only found in one island off the coast of Brazil, it has great pressures. Um, it is um, an island that is frequented by tourists and fishermen that, you know, kill snakes. And so when the snake only exists on one island, um, any time a snake is, you know, uh, killed, that's a big problem. And so her work is actually going out to research the snake and learn more about it, but also to get um, candidate listing as a critically endangered species under the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which will raise its, um, its conservation profile and list it as a globally threatened species, which is really important that brings global awareness for the snake. Um, as a result of Save the Snake's funding, um, uh, Jeanne and her team were able to get additional funding. And so now this project is funded for two years. Um, so we'll have some, a lot of cool updates with this endangered pit viper. We also support a uh, conservationist in Ecuador, um, Maria Elena, who is working with um, indigenous communities throughout um, rural parts of Ecuador, at basically translating snake bite information and snake awareness, like educational materials, into indigenous languages. Uh, and so this is really important. So because, um, you know, not every community around the world speaks the dominant language of a country. And Ecuador, uh, being a Spanish-speaking country, there are people there who may not speak, um, you know, Spanish. They might speak uh, Quechua or other indigenous languages. And so Marie and her team are going out and, yeah, translating their materials um, into these languages so that people have this really important information about snake bite. Because it's not just the United States where we have myths about what to do with a snake bite situation. It's in Ecuador, it's in India, it's all over the world. And so this is getting really important information to communities who need it the most. But more important too, is that by engaging all of these people, uh, she's also kind of ga gathering um, a team of citizen scientists. So people who have their eyes out in these you know, remote parts of Ecuador, looking for endangered Bushmasters vipers. And so now these people that know her, if they ever see this endangered snake, they'll call her and so that she can gather more information about this snake. And so this is the really important uh, aspect of all Save the Snakes programs is that there is community involvement and that we have someone from you know, the country, from the community leading these efforts, getting the communities involved so that they can protect snakes together. And then I've mentioned Nepal a few times, and it's a project that we, we very much love. It's um, working in Western, actually throughout N Nepal, but the project started in Western Nepal, uh, you know, focusing on snake bite and reduction to human snake conflict. Uh, this is Kamal Devkota, who's affiliated with the um, Nepal Toxinology uh, Society, and he's a herpetologist, so working to study king cobras. And so for the last few years, he has developed a series of snake bite information centers um, throughout Western Nepal. And as a result, um, thousands of people have learned really important information about snake bite. Um, a, an issue in Nepal is that sometimes people will not go to a hospital to receive snake bite treatment. They'll go to a traditional healer where um, they'll be prescribed different uh, ways to treat snake bite. Um, not anti-venom though. You can only receive that at the local hospital. And so as a result of his programs, people are now going to the hospitals to get treatment, which is really important. And again, similar to Maria Elena's project in Ecuador, by working throughout so many places, now everyone knows to contact him about snakes. And he's been able to um, map the distribution of king cobras throughout the country, which is very important because if we know where king cobras are, um, we can work to protect this globally threatened species. 
and two more products I want to talk about, and these are actually in Africa. Um, so Africa is an area where uh, snake bite has really had quite a, a toll uh, for people around the, the, the continent. And so we have two projects in Zambia and as well as in South Africa that are just mostly focused on education and human snake conflict mitigation. So just trying to get um, communities to be more aware about where snakes are in the environment and how, you know, in reducing the uh, potential for a bite. Because um, a bite in some of these communities is just, it's devastating. Um, it can um, not only, you know, disable someone, but it can kill them. And it, it can bring families into poverty if someone uh, passes away from a snake bite that might have been the breadwinner, so earning the income of the family. Um, and so to reduce that burden, uh, our team in Zambia is going out and providing many, many presentations and also training people actually how to remove snakes from homes and workplaces and so forth. And lastly, the same is uh, the, this, um, with South Africa as well, where we actually have an international chapter of our organization in South Africa and working in schools and uh, communities across Eastern South Africa to mitigate human snake conflict. And so with all of that global conservation of snakes, um, it became over the last um, four years, our organization has grown to the point where um, we can't do it alone. And so in 2000, actually this year of January, we opened the Snake Conservation Center. And we have our own facility, again, uh, right next to River Bend Park in Sacramento. And this is an area where we're able to um, assist our conservation partners um, but also to begin programs for uh, people in California. And this includes a venomous snake training program. So if you have rattlesnakes um, around your area, so whether they come onto your property or you know people who might be working in an area with venomous snakes, I encourage you to look into our venomous snake training program where we teach people, whether they're landowners, wildlife biologists, you know, passionate citizens who like snakes um, to, safely contain um, and professionally work with these animals. Um, we really want to um, make sure that people are empowered to deal with a, a snake themselves. Because when you do encounter a snake, there's not a, many things you could do. Um, you could either kill the snake yourself, um, which is not doesn't really solve the problem because if you kill it, another snake is likely to come back. And so, and we don't wanna keep killing snakes. It's not a sustainable form of pest control. You could call a snake rescue or a pest control service, but they can be expensive. Um, sometimes I've, I've heard pest control companies or snake relocators charging over $100. And so what this program is doing is actually trying to get people to be able to move the snakes themselves safely and professionally. And so it's actually easier than you think. Um, but also at our center, we're developing school programs where our Snakes to Schools project is literally, you know, bringing our team of ambassador animals to um, schools to educate them, not only about the amazing world of snakes, but what to do in a snake situation, whether you find a snake on the school campus or out in the wild, um, but then also trying to really install uh, some environmental ethics so that there's uh, inspiration and love of wildlife and nature. Um, and then, yes, in doing lots of community outreach events around the Sacramento area. If anyone would like to support our organization, we also take groups uh, to very fantastic places. And this year, we will be going to Costa Rica to on a conservation eco-tour. Now, it won't just be snakes all the time, but we'll see nesting sea turtles, howling howler monkeys, um, some beautiful birds and many other wildlife species. And we'll probably see a few snakes along the way. But it's a wonderful way to be able to travel with our team and, and learn about the amazing sights of Costa Rica. But in the future, we'll be taking groups down to the Mojave Desert, some local trips as well to some very cool places around California. And then also actually in the future to South Africa as well. So if anyone is interested, please visit our website for more. And as we, we just left February, which is always a uh, special time for lovebirds, but I just I can't resist and ask any, everyone to be our Serpentine Valentine for our Valentine's Day messages. But we are a nonprofit organization. And so we are very, very humbled when someone does donate to our cause. And if 
any of those who are listening are inspired by the work that we do, I invite you to learn more about our work at SaveTheSnakes.org. Um, and we also have some very cool gifts, including a book called Snakes for Kids, which I was a lot of fun to write. And if you're interested in a cool snake book, you can pick it up on our website or you can figure out a time and maybe come by and visit the center. And with that, I want to say thank you so much. And I know we've uh, been talking for so long about snakes and I want to hear your questions all about snakes. So I'm going to switch it over to Corky if she's there and then we can answer some questions. Excellent. Oh, thank you. That was great. Um, let's see. There I am. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm sure people were interested in many different kinds of things that you were talking about, but interestingly, three of the questions that came in are quite similar. Um, and so let's see. The first one was, um, what should you do if you're bitten by a rattlesnake far away from a road? Should you walk slowly, hmm. quickly, or if you have a cell phone, do you call and then you stay and you wait for help? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, it actually comes up quite a bit. Um, this is always like, um, I like to think of those, you're on a desert island and, you know, it's like those big what if scenarios. Um, because again, most snake bikes, um, they do happen if people are out backpacking and they're really far away. Um, but there's... Those situations do occur, but again, most snake bites, you might be pretty local and hopefully within cell range. And so again, if you, a cell phone, definitely, I would immediately call 911 and try and get them to come out to you. Um, if you are alone, ideally you'd want to get to the nearest point so that an ambulance could take you away, right? So if you have to slowly walk to like an edge of a road, um, would recommend doing that. But if you're able to stay put, and just that's the best thing to do. Um, and this comes up quite a bit for people who do spend a lot of time in nature, like backpackers or campers. Um, you know, hopefully if you're going out into nature, you're also going to prepare yourself, you know, for, you know, a bad fall or other situations who are also very dangerous. And so investing in um, a GPS unit, the, like the spot beacons and things like that, those can be life-saving devices. Um, but the point is, is that you want emergency services to come to you if possible. Um, you may have to go to them um, and emergency services will be able to kind of give you that information. And I do want to point out too, um, sometimes in low cell service situations, um, you can text 911. Um, you need to check with your local county though, because not every county around the United States has text to 911, but that is a very good way that you can... Um, be in touch with the emergency services in a low cell area. So the next one is again, similar, and you sort of touched on it, but you didn't quite answer it, is if you are backpacking and you're several days out um, from the trailhead. Yeah, um, again, that's a tough situation. And hopefully you will not, you will be a good backpacker and a safe backpacker and you'll have that point spot beacon. But if you're not, you have to survive. And so you may have to hike yourself out. Um, because the reality is, is that you won't, unless you have like um, an underlying condition that would make you um, more likely to react severely to a snake bite, it could take a long time. It could take a day or so before you're, you know, before you die. Um, but sometimes people don't die. They just have, um, you know, they're disabled from it. Um, so yeah, getting out to emergency services, um, probably backpacking out but hopefully you'll invest in like a, a spot beacon of some kind. All right. And the, the third one that was related was asking if, if you're alone, you don't have help, but yeah, I think you've kind of touched on that. Um, oh, let's see. Chat scrolled on me. Um, oh, this is kind of fun. What is the snake speech sees that you used for your logo? Yeah, that is um, a king cobra. So it's actually a, a, a young king cobra. So one that is freshly hatched out of an egg. Um, very uh, important because it's uh, king cobra is a, sort of a flagship species for snake conservation, being arguably one of the most recognized snakes in the world. But it's also the first snake conservation project that we supported in South India. 
Next one is, um, what age or grade group do you do school presentations and how much do they cost and do you come to Davis? Uh, yes, so um, we have actually, we're developing these programs and we are at a point where we don't actually have an official age range yet. And we will, we will speak to all groups and we actually don't have a cost set up as well. And so it's, um, I would invite you to email me at Starkey, S-T-A-R-K-E-Y, at savethesnakes.org. Or you can find us on our website, our contact information. But we are literally developing the program right now, and we can tailor it to any age group. So our goal is to have the program um, be for uh, Title I schools and schools along the American River or other areas um, where they might encounter venomous snakes um, for the fall of 2022, but we can present to schools earlier for the spring or even for summer camps, things like that. Yeah, we don't get them in the bypass, mm. <laughs> but we do get them um, sometimes in the surrounding uh, areas. And certainly for those of us that go up near Cache Creek uh, and in that vicinity, um, so there, our next question here is, do you have any quick statements that mediate statements like, I hate snakes, the only good snake is a dead snake. Uh, people often say that while I'm holding a snake and I'm never sure what to say. <laughs> yeah, that can always be, um, so I, I have great empathy for you because that's something we encounter quite a bit. Um, it's always funny when we're tabling at an event and hoping to educate people about snakes and People come up and like, oh, I killed a snake yesterday, and they're 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 not necessarily like trying to show off. It's just um, anyway, it's it's an interesting thing, and um, the the way that we approach it as an organization and how we instruct our staff and our, our volunteers is you have great empathy for someone when they actually they express that or they say they hate snakes, and we try and always um, see where people are coming from. Um, you know, using maybe the Socratic method, if anyone knows that, but you ask questions, right? So it's like, oh, so why do you hate snakes? And and it, it might come down to a reason of like, oh, well, I have, I have children and, and I would hate it if something happened to my my child or my dog or, you know, or my dog was bitten. And, you, you know, you, you honor those feelings and you say, and this is probably a little more in depth than people wanted to hear, but this works. Um, you know, you you say like, oh, I, it's, it's great that you you want to keep your child safe. So here's what you can do to keep your, your yard snake safe. And then that's when you give the constructive way. Um, because it's never, conservation of wildlife never works if you, if you shame people or you, you know, you're like, oh, you know, you need to love this animal. Um, you work together. And so even if they might come off as combative, really quickly, just by asking a few questions, you can kind of bring that anxiety down and then you, you can work together to solve the snake problem. So Aurora, age six, would like to know, why do snake eyes look the way that they do? What makes their eye pupil narrow? Yeah, so I can show, maybe we can see this. I think you can see that. So yes. this San Francisco garter snake has a big round pupil. And that is because it is, you know, active during the day. And it's just like our light, um, our eyes, um, they constrict and grow uh, depending on the amount of light. So as our pupils get nice and big in low light settings, it allows us to, to see more, to be able to um, you know, absorb as much light as possible so that it allows our, our retinas to do their job. And so the snakes is kind of the same. And so that's why it's a little bit of a myth that venomous snakes have you know, slitted pupils or like cat-like pupils. But even cats and venomous snakes, you know, during the day, they might have very thin little pupils. But then if you catch them at night, they're going to have big, wide pupils. And so their pupils change just like ours, depending on how much light is there, because they're used to be able to see better at night. Super. Excellent question, by the way, Aurora. Thank you. I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, yeah. Oh, do snakes swim? There you go. Oh yeah, snakes love to swim. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so depending on the species, right? Um, so some snakes like our garter snakes, the giant garter snake um, is actually the most aquatic of all garter snakes. 
and swims in open water. But even our rattlesnakes, um, they can be found swimming across Folsom Lake, trying to get from point A to point B. Um, but some species may not be as adapted, but most snakes can, can swim if they have to. Yeah. Super. Well, great. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us this evening. Uh, great presentation, a couple of thank yous coming in. Uh, really enjoyed having you share with us uh, all the wonderful things about snakes and a little bit about how to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Um, just a quick reminder uh, that we do have the Sacramento Perch presentation next time. So there they are, the Sacramento Perch that we now have living in our demonstration area. Uh, and also hoping that you'll bring your family out um, and enjoy California Duck Days uh, end of April. Date change, those of you who didn't know, um, so that we can do a fully outdoor event. And Michael will be here um, with his organization along with many other community um, uh, nature-related various kinds of organizations. <laughs> Can't wait All for right. that days. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. Thanks so much, Michael. All right. Thank you all very much. Have a great night and uh, stay safe.